For those of you familiar with TBC, you won't be surprised to hear that rogues are easily one of the best melee and are even considered to be one of the best classes in the game. And considering their toolkit comprises of incredible crowd control, excellent damage output, and some of the best defensives around, it's clear to see just why rogues are so dominant in TBC PvP. So with that being said, in today's guide, we'll be providing you with everything you need to know to get your rogue set up for PvP once Season 1 of TBC begins, to kickstart your journey to Gladiator or even the brand new Season 1 Rank 1 title, Inferno Gladiator. Before we get into it though, while this guide is the perfect starting point for those of you looking to get into TBC PvP, we've got follow-up class guides being released at skillcaps.com slash wow in the coming weeks. With those guides, you'll learn how to deal damage and play your class at the highest level in Arena. So if you're interested in taking your TBC game to the next level, be sure to head on over to skillcaps.com slash wow and sign up today to gain access to our future TBC content the moment it's released. To kick things off, we'll be taking a look at what the best races are for rogues, starting with the Alliance faction. Although you've got a couple options here, Human stands above the rest as the absolute best race for Alliance Rogues and is even considered by some as the best overall race on either faction. This all comes down to the power of Perception, a human racial trait that dramatically increases stealth detection when used. And given just how important openers are in TBC Arena, especially in the earlier seasons where gear levels are not as high, you'll quickly start to see that rogues who get the opener against other rogues are more than likely to win the game. It's also important to understand how the meta impacts the strength of this racial trait, as rogues will likely be one of the most played classes in PvP early on, with druids following suit in later seasons. Alternatively, Gnome is a decent pick if you really don't want to play human. Escape Artist is an excellent tool for maintaining uptime on mages, but ultimately pales in comparison to the power of perception on humans. Moving on to the Horde, again we've got a couple options, but again we've got a single race that stands above the rest and that's Undead. Their racial trait, Will of the Forsaken, is great early on but will become even stronger in later seasons as you start to face Warlocks more and more. And it's not just Warlocks it's good against as it'll help you stay out of crowd control against Priests too. What makes Will of the Forsaken so great is that it doesn't share a cooldown with your PvP trinket, and after using it to remove a fear, you'll also become immune to follow-up fears for a few more seconds. This means when you're up against a Warlock, you're free to trinket a stun or a coil while still being able to then break out of a fear with Will of the Forsaken. If you were looking for an alternate pick though, Orcs are definitely a viable option due to the strength of hardiness which increases the chance that you resist stuns, which can be useful when up against other rogues. Ultimately though, Undead is simply too strong to not recommend. And between the two factions, honestly, it's quite hard to make that call. Although Human is insane early on, especially in Rogue Mage Mirrors, you'll find that the abundance of Warlocks in later seasons really brings out the strength of Undead. In addition to this, as gear levels rise and openers become less important, the power of perception loses value. Either way, you'll do fine as either Human or Undead. But if you're looking to min-max, we'd say that Alliance has the edge in Season 1. But towards the end of the expansion, you'll definitely get more value out of Undead. Next, we'll be taking a look at exactly what talents you should be using for competitive arena in TBC. Now, while some of these talents might not be ideal for other forms of PvP, this is definitely the build we recommend for Arena. While most of these talents are quite straightforward and don't impact your gameplay much, there are a few that stand out as being quite integral to the way you'll be playing your Rogue. First, we have Ghostly Strike, which is a versatile ability that can be used to gain dodge chance for a short duration in an attempt to avoid things like an incoming kidney shot. Next, we have Hemorrhage, which is actually your primary combo point builder. While almost all of your energy will go into using Hemo, you'll also be using Shiv to generate combo points and keep poisons up, but that's something we'll touch on later. Another super important talent you'll be picking up is Preparation. This one is insane for both offensive and defensive play, depending on how you use it. First, by using it really early on, you can significantly increase the pace of an arena game and overwhelm opponents with pressure by chaining vanishes near the start of a game. Alternatively, relying on it as a defensive cooldown to reset the CD of things like Evasion and Shadow Step is a great way to make yourself more durable. And speaking of Shadow Step, this iconic spell is another one of your talents that play a huge role in what you're able to do as a rogue. Of course, it can simply be used as mobility to stick to your target or pull back into a defensive position. But skilled rogues will also use it as a way to crowd control other opponents at important times. For example, by doing things like a shadow step plus kick on a healer to secure a kill. And last up, Cheat Death is a talent that has the potential to save you, although in the earlier seasons it won't be too reliable. This is because it does indeed scale with resilience, which means as we gear up throughout the expansion and resilience levels get higher, Cheat Death will become stronger and stronger and can end up as a very reliable cooldown to prolong your death and keep you in the game. 
Now, although the cookie cutter build we showed you at the start of this section can pretty much be used at all times, there are one or two changes worth considering. First, in the assassination tree, you can swap out vile poisons for improved poisons if you anticipate that you won't be facing plenty of druids as they're capable of dispelling your poisons. This means if you seem to just be facing priests over and over again, specking into improved poisons will provide you with a little more value out of your talents. Another optional change you can make is again in the assassination tree, and that's to take two points out of lethality and put them into improved exposed armor. This is something you'll want to do in later seasons as gear levels rise, but for now, at the start of season 1, it won't be necessary. Moving on to our next section, we'll be discussing exactly what your pre-bis and season 1 bis gear looks like. Starting with the pre-bis, there's a handful of important items you'll want to prioritize getting early on, as they'll be carrying over to your season 1 bis set. First, we've got the Master's Treads, a pair of BOE boots you can grab from the auction house that increases your effective stealth level. As we already explained how important openers are early on, these boots are invaluable. We've then got two items you'll be crafting via your professions, the Knight's Eye Panther figurine from Jewel Crafting and Dragon Maw from Blacksmithing. Again, we've got the effective stealth level being increased by the Jewel Crafting Trinket, so aim to get it as early as possible. And Dragon Maw is simply a great weapon that you'll again want to craft as soon as possible. Next, you'll need to farm badges for a handful of items, including the Choker of Vile Intent, which will stay with you throughout Season 1. In addition to this, you'll also want to pick up a Searing Sunblade for badges, which will also stay with you throughout Season 1, as even though this dagger will get upgraded, you'll want to hold on to it as you'll need access to 3 daggers for poison swapping, which is something we'll touch on in more detail later. Part of the reason why this dagger is so great is because of the low weapon speed, but again, that's something we'll touch on later. The last item you'll want to pick up from badges is the Blood Knight War Cloak, which will get replaced during Season 1 but is an excellent starting cloak. Now, moving on to honor gear, both the bracers and belt will stay with you throughout Season 1, so aim to farm them as quickly as possible. In addition, the helmet and gloves are also something you'll want to farm to use early on, although these will get replaced. And of course, don't forget to pick up a medallion for your PvP trinket which you obviously won't be replacing. Now, the remaining pieces that make up the rest of your pre bis gear will all be replaced, but should still be obtained early as you'll be relying on drops from Karazhan and Arena Points to replace these items. Each of these items drop from dungeons, so you'll have some work to do once you hit level 70. We've got the Shoulder Pass of Assassination and Tunic of Assassination, which provide you with a great 2 set that you can benefit from early in the season. The Legs Midnight Leg Guards have a ton of stats in addition to some much needed hit rating, and you'll also want to farm the Ring Ravenclaw Band and the Throne Weapon Sethic Feather Darts. All this leaves is your second ring, Band of the Exorcist, which you'll need to farm Spirit Shards to obtain. Now, as Season 1 progresses, you'll slowly be replacing some of these items, mostly from Karazhan and with Arena Points. With Arena Points, you'll want to purchase the Gladiator's Helmet, Shoulders, Chest, Gloves, Shiv, and Throne Weapon. You'll then be replacing your Cloak, Legs, and one of the rings from Karazhan with the Drape of the Dark Reavers, Skulker's Greaves, and Garona's Signet Ring. Your other ring, Ring of the Recalcitrant, will come from Antherodon's Lair and is a guaranteed draw from this one boss raid quest. Alright, with your Biss lists all set up, let's discuss how you'll be gemming and enchanting your gear. In the early seasons, attack power scales better than agility, so you'll want to stick red attack power gems all over your gear, mostly ignoring socket bonuses other than for your meta gem, which will be the swift skyfire diamond. In order to activate your meta gem, you'll just want to use two orange attack power and crit gems. As for enchants, the only enchant that changes over the course of the season is crusader on weapons being upgraded to mongoose, mostly due to it being inaccessible early on as it'll need to first drop and then be affordable. Other than that, you'll want to get glyph of ferocity on helm, your Aldor or Squire inscription on shoulders, improved stealth on cloak, major resilience on chest, assault on bracers, superior agility on gloves, nether cobra leg armor on legs, and sure-footed on boots. The last thing to touch on before we move on is hit rating. Unlike modern WoW which has a number of stats you want to consider shuffling around, TBC really only has one stat you need to consider outside of what you choose to prioritize with your gems, and that's hit rating. All that's needed is 5% to not miss abilities, and with these sets of gear, you'll easily stay above that 5% threshold. And while more than 5% does help with landing more white hits which can help with poison procs, it really isn't necessary and you'll be fine hovering just above 5%. Next up, we've got professions which we've already mentioned so won't require too much more discussion. Both blacksmithing and jewel crafting will be your optimal professions to skill up early on as you'll be able to craft items that will stay with you throughout season 1 in the Mace Dragon Maw and the Trinket Knight's Eye Panther. Now the only thing to consider here is if you're able to obtain Spite Blade from Karazhan, you'll actually want
want to drop blacksmithing in favor of enchanting as you'll no longer need to use dragon maw given that spite blade is an upgrade. This will therefore allow you to enchant your rings with plus 4 stats. So just keep that in mind if you're looking to seriously min max your character during season 1. Moving on, we're going to be providing you with some key macros as well as some tips and tricks that'll help you get started with your rogues once season 1 begins. Starting with macros, there's a handful of important ones that will help to make your gameplay much more fluid, especially in the openers. These are Arena 1-3 macros for both Sap and Shadow Step plus Cheap Shot. By having these macros, you'll be able to spam them on a target and stealth that you want to crowd control as soon as they show up. With the sap macros, you'll be able to spam sap on a rogue or druid that you're attempting to find in stealth. The shadow step cheap shot macros on the other hand are mostly only useful against other rogue mage teams, but they can make the world of difference to instantly step towards a rogue that opens and immediately stun them before they can build momentum. You'll then of course want focus macros for all of your crowd control just to make it easier to crowd control players that you are not targeting, allowing you to continue attacking your main target while still being able to crowd control your focus target. In addition to all of this, you can feel free to macro premeditation into all of your openers, including cheap shot and ambush, just to get the extra combo points without having to think of an extra bind for premed. And last up, you'll need weapon swap macros, which is something we touched on earlier. With these, you'll be able to swap in and out of crippling and wound poison depending on the situation. This of course means, as we mentioned earlier in this guide, you will need to have access to two offhands. You'll want to make sure that wound poison is applied to the fastest one for quickly building up wound poison stacks either with white hits or with shiv. And if you remember earlier when we mentioned the searing sunblade that had a fast weapon speed, well this is why having that fast weapon option is so great. You will then want a second offhand with crippling poison which you can swap to whenever you need to slow people. And again, this can be done on demand with shiv. Now you'll obviously want to spend as much time as possible with two wound poison weapons against classes that can dispel poison such as resto druids as you'll be required to keep reapplying your wound poison if they dispel. So that's why it's important to have weapon swap macros, to get out a crippling poison weapon whenever a slow is needed. Moving on, we've got a handful of extra tips and tricks, starting with how and when you'll want to apply bleeds. First and foremost, the obvious is going to be when facing enemy rogues, as getting bleeds up will help counter their restelts. In addition to this, you'll want to bleed warriors as bleeds ignore armor, so you get a lot of value out of doing so. Now when it comes to exposed armor, it's great to do this on cross and leather targets, as you'll be getting their armor much closer to zero than you do with using exposed armor on plate or mail. Next we've got what's probably our coolest tip, which is to make sure not to neglect your focus target combo points with deadly throw. See, whenever you focus cheap shot, gouge, shiv, etc, you'll actually generate combo points on your focus target. This then gives you the opportunity to use deadly throw on your focus target to interrupt a cast from range. Just remember that if you generate combo points on your main target after generating them on your focus target, you'll no longer be able to focus deadly throw. And the last tip is quite a niche one but it could win you some games, and that's to swap over to a dagger in your main hand to ambush a target if you believe that damage would finish them off. Again, this is super niche and won't happen often at all, and obviously you only want to do this if it's actually going to be a killing blow. Otherwise, you benefit much more from just waiting out the opener and going for a garrote or cheap shot for control. In this final section, we'll be going over exactly what your best comps are in both 2s and 3s. Starting with 2s, one comp stands far above the rest, not only as the best 2s comp for rogues but also as one of the best 2s comps in the game. Rogue Mage packs a serious punch in the early seasons of TBC as people have low resilience in the start which the comp can take advantage of given how explosive it can be with excellent crowd control options and high damage. And the icing on the cake? Well, this comp is unbelievable against one of the most popular 2s comps, Warrior Resto Druid. Next, we've got Rogue Priest, which is also great early on, much for the same reasons that Rogue Mage is good for. The high amount of damage both the Rogue and Priest are able to output early on into enemies with low resilience makes the comp very explosive and allows you to finish games quickly all while having the added support of a healer. If you were looking for a slightly more niche pick, Rogue Lock is certainly a viable pick with some great matchups. But overall, it is a poor man's Rogue Mage and you would be better off pairing yourself with a mage instead. And last up, we have to mention Rogue Druid. Although this comp won't be particularly amazing in the early seasons, as we progress through the expansions and Resto Druids gear up, this will eventually become the best rogue comp due to how the pacing of the game will change. Things slow down and eventually the rogue druid synergy can effectively crowd control players endlessly, allowing you to set up some crazy kills while not letting the enemy team play. Moving into threes, rogues have two comps that not only stand above any other comp they can play, but also just happen to be the very best comps in the game in season 1. Both RMP and RLP 
share many similarities in terms of their strength. The damage output is very high and depending on how you manage your cooldowns, you can end games super quickly by just running over your opponents. Again, this really comes down to how much damage people take with lower resilience levels nearer the start of the expansion, which makes it much easier for rogue comps to come away with quick wins from the opener. Alright guys, that about does it for this beginner's guide to rogues in TBC. Hopefully, you picked up a few tips and tricks along the way. And remember, if you're interested in taking your game to the next level, be sure to head on over to skillcaps.com slash wow and sign up today to gain access to our follow-up TBC class guides the moment they're released. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.